Good evening, nice people. I begin, um, appropriately, with thanks to Rachel Lawson and Elise Adler of the Nashville Public Library, to Karen Hayes and the Parnassus Books crew and the dogs of Parnassus Books as well, uh, to the city of Nashville and Mayor Briley and to the citizens of Nashville, including my editor, Jenny Smith Younts, who lives and works here in Nashville. This book is the best thing that has happened to me as a writer since I wrote an earlier book on the American street food revolution, and one of the subjects of that book, Big Gay Ice Cream in New York City, reserved an abandoned West Village mortuary and convinced a drag queen named Bambi Galore to escort me on a night on the town in New York City. Here we are crossing the threshold for my reading. So thank you, Nashville. It's the second best thing that's ever happened for a book I've written. This is the painting that hangs above my desk as I write. And appropriately, I begin thanks tonight um, by talking of John Edgerton, um, whose son March and wife Anne are here tonight. Um, as I write, that painting calls out to me. Um, it's a memorial to John, and the last time I spoke of John um, at any length was in this room for his memorial service. One of my goals tonight is to remind you of the promise John saw in this city and the promise he saw in writing and thinking about food. I learned to explore the South while borrowing from John. Over a half century career, he sketched a democratic portrait of this region and its people. His books were laments on race and class. They were catalogs of regional distinctiveness and documents of its presumed demise. There were rousts of the demons that lurked in this briar patch. There were jousts plotted to dislodge the wealthy and powerful from their perches. Reading his words, I learned that writing about food didn't have to be an exercise in indulgence. Following his lead, I took tentative steps toward paying down the debts of pleasure that I owed and we owe to our forebears. Tonight, I aim to meditate on, among other matters, the future of Southern food, the idea of progress, informed by John's belief in this town. But before I do that, first allow me to establish, I don't know, my bona fides in Nashville. I claim a long love affair with this city. In the 1980s, I lived in an apartment down by the river, and that was when I first made my run, my very first run, through the line at Hap Towns for stewed raisins and smoked pork chops, smothered pork chops. Hap was already retired by then, but on occasion, he still stood behind the line and offered to dip me a plate. During that same era, I went to the Gerst house for oyster rolls and pig knuckles. The next phase of my association with Nashville was in the 2000s when I got to know Nashville through John. Um, and I got to know Will Campbell that way, the radical Baptist preacher who lived in your midst for so long. I spent one epic day at Will's cabin um, in which Will baptized a child played up against the wall, you redneck mother on his guitar, drank moonshine and offered me a slug of moonshine saying, care for a slug of the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> During that same phase, I asked John who was the inheritor of the Hap Towns legacy, and he introduced me to Jack Arnold in overalls and a florid bow tie and Rose, his vivacious wife from Columbia, South America, and Khalil, their son, the heir apparent. As the Southern Foodways Alliance, which I direct, rose, I got to know Nashville in new ways through Southern Foodways Alliance events. I heard Valerie June on the back of a flatbed truck in the rear yard of City House. I greeted Phyla Ha on the sidewalk at Station Inn as E.W. Mayo fried pies. And I watched as Andre Prince Jeffries in this picture talked prostitutes and hot chicken at Pat Martin's downtown barbecue joint for another SFA event. All of that is to say that Nashville has had a big impact on me, on my life, on my writing. And to that point, Nashville, as those of you who have had a chance to read the book know, Nashville is all over this book I wrote. Um, 
Nashville was a locus for the training of civil rights workers in the 1960s. This is a shot from Jackson, Mississippi, but what I'm about to say has appropriateness no matter. During prep classes staged by black students in Nashville and elsewhere, activists learned to protect the skull, fold the hands over the head to prevent disfigurement of the face, bring the elbows together in front of the eyes. My book grapples, too, with Nashville businessman and political animal John J. Hooker and his investments in the Minnie Pearl and Mahalia Jackson's, that's Mahalia there on the right, uh, Minnie Pearl and Mahalia Jackson's fried chicken. Anticipating the market segmentation that is rampant today, John J. Hooker developed brands that could appeal in turn to white consumers and black consumers. And I also developed, as you know, a chapter on the farm and Nashville's welcome of the hippies and the back to the land hippies who settled in central Tennessee in 1971. It's always remarkable to me to think that just three years after Dr. King was gunned down in Memphis, hippies in the hate in San Francisco, the epicenter of the summer of love, saw promise in middle Tennessee, believed that this was the place to realize their fortunes, where they could grow crops, where they could raise healthy babies. They moved to Tennessee. Anybody know where the shot was taken? It's Bailey and Cato's. That's their hot water cornbread. I'm going to leave it there as kind of a meditation. <laughs> I miss that place. Before we go too deep on Nashville, let's talk about how food means and what food means. Food is, of course, an essential to life. Producing, distributing, serving, and consuming food that's one of our nation's biggest industries. Owing to malnutrition, not enough food, too much of the wrong sort of food, food is also society's greatest cause of disease and death. In other words, food matters. What enters or leaves the doors of our body is the basis of morality, wrote Lillian Smith, the Georgia activist and author of books like Killers of the Dream and Strange Fruit. She was writing, of course, of among other things, sex and gastronomy. That makes sense, for intercourse and supper are the two most intimate acts in which we humans engage. And we eat supper a lot more often. <laughs> and when we dine in a restaurant, far more people watch. <laughs> Yet, we take food lightly. Oftentimes, the academy overlooks it or ghettoizes it. So do public intellectuals and pop culture arbiters. On that subject, John, Re excuse me, John Henry Fabra said this. I love this quote. History celebrates the battlefields whereon we meet our death, but scorns the speak of the plowed fields whereby we thrive. It knows the names of the king's bastards, but cannot tell us the origin of wheat. This is the way of human folly. So here's my take on food. Food is a social artifact, a pattern of culture and interaction worthy of acute observation. Eating is an agricultural act, Kentucky native Wendell Berry once wrote. In the South, that act has been fraught, for in addition to being virtuous work in which writers like Berry take justifiable pride, agriculture begat the region's original sin, slavery. After the Civil War, white efforts to retain and later disinherit that labor have limited the horizons of black and white Southerners alike. More recently, on the long and fitful march to equality, struggles over food have reflected and affected change. Food offers entree to big issues, including class discrimination, gender inequity, chronic poverty. For so long, our people were poor, wrecked by pellagra and other nutritional deficiencies, and yet our streams teemed with fish, our fields were flush with game, and our gardens offered an unsurpassed bounty. The story I cover in the pot liquor papers, the story I think I kind of write over and over again in magazine articles and other outlets, is a radical narrative of traditionally marginalized groups who gain power through their contributions to the table. It's a story about how, beginning with the black cooks who fueled the 1955 to 1956 Montgomery bus boycott, Southerners in maid uniforms and coveralls and gravy-splattered aprons have challenged American ideas about agriculture, justice, and identity. Growing, cooking, 
in serving food, African Americans, women, the poor, people identifying as LGBTQ have expressed subversive creativity and gained economic power. I wrote a book about the South and grounded in the past and a whole lot of people in Nashville read it and responded to it. Thank you for that, genuinely. I plumbed the past to make sense of how we got here, but my focus now is on the present and on the future. In addition to my work as a writer, I direct the Southern Foodways Alliance. We're based at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. We document and study and explore the diverse food cultures of the changing American South. A couple years back during an SFA board meeting, one of our board members said, maybe y'all might want to include the word preserve in your mission statement. I mean, y'all collect oral histories, that's preservation, right? And my colleagues at that point objected vehemently. They said, we don't aim to preserve the South. Yes, we document the South but we don't want to thwart change. We embrace change in the South, for the South has long been overdue for change. SFA recognizes that culture is a process, not a product, and it's ongoing. Now, when I first began thinking and writing about the South, I focused on continuities. Traveling Northeast Georgia, I searched for the oldest mole joint still run by the same family. It's chicken mole, anybody know it other than Sean? It's good stuff. Very few places still make it. And I went looking for it. In the Kentucky bluegrass, I quested for dent meal hoe cakes, cooked according to 19th century techniques, and served in storied quarters. Here in Tennessee, I drove the two-lane blue highways for whole hog barbecue, cooked over hickory wood coals in communities like Jack's Creek over near Lexington. Even when I traveled beyond the region, I focused on places that presented the South in amber, in Brooklyn, New York, I trekked to the North Carolina store for South meat and knee highs. On the south side of Chicago, <laughs> this, I love this place, I savored sweet potato pie at Baby Jean's Yazoo, Mississippi style soul food. That was the entire name of the place. It was on the window. At those places, I longed for kind of essential experiments, ex excuse me, essential experiences that cemented my belief in the region and in the narratives that defined its people. I grasped for tethers to the past, and I blinded myself to the changes afoot in the region. As late as the 1990s, I spouted an occasional Southern by the grace of God line. In the early 2000s, I wrote a newspaper column called Saving Southern Food that implied something might be lost as new peoples claimed this place. I used to define the South in opposition to the North, which I came to reckon implied in ways subtle and obtuse that I was fighting an old and ugly fight I knew to be indefensible and untenable. More recently, I fully rejected cultural conservatism. Instead of telling stories that reinforce old ways, I now quest for narratives that subvert. I tell stories that redefine my region. I plan meals that privilege immigrant cooks. I grab what other megaphone is available to announce that I prefer Szechuan fried chicken tossed with peppercorn nubs to the golden crusted birds your cast iron wi skillet wielding grandmother cooks. When I speak of Mississippi, I sing songs of Mexican tortas layered with al pastor pork and avocados. When I talk of Nashville, I regale folks with tales of Tennessee halal fried chicken, which I tried to eat today down on Nolansville Pike and ended up eating instead really great Persian food, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> I'm supposed to click this now. I can recommend this album to you. <laughs> Chingo Bling is from Houston, Texas. And for a while he was a rapper, now he's a stand-up comedian. His message is the same. So a year or so back, I delivered opening remarks at a conference on immigrant food culture in the American South. During the lead-up, I kept thinking about a challenge made by one of my Southern Foodways Alliance colleagues. She asked, why do we have to refer to newly arrived Southerners as immigrants? It was a really simple question. Why does it matter when they arrived, she asked. Why are we segregating them? Aren't they Southerners too? I thought that today as I walked from the 21C Hotel here and saw the protesters um, 
arguing against ICE enforcement in Nashville. And I thought about who are the Southerners I claim. When I stepped on the stage of that conference, I shared those challenges my colleague made and floated a new way of thinking. I'm a passive Southerner, I told the crowd. I was born in Georgia to parents who were native to Florida and South Carolina. My belonging was handed to me. I didn't quit family and cross Sonora to claim the South. My grandfather didn't scale the bow of a ship to earn a seat in the hold and sail beyond the Gulf of Tonkin. Immigrants are active Southerners, I told the crowd. They choose to live here, to raise families, to grow businesses. Despite unfavorable odds that may, in a new age of American isolation, temporarily thwart innovation and acceptance, active Southerners are now reinventing the region. In the process, as an already complicated region embraces new people and cultural nuances accrete, much is gained, especially for eaters. I was proud of that active Southerner construction. At the conference in Birmingham, I smiled when another one of my colleagues stepped to the mic and used the same frame. I was kind of full of myself, actually. In the weeks that followed, I returned to that moment on stage, though. I told myself, this is original thinking, particularly well-suited for our peculiar moment. But then, a couple months later, when I was recording the audio vision of my book, The Pot Liquor Papers, I read a passage I'd forgotten about. Um, I read a passage about Bill Neal, the vanguard Chapel Hill, North Carolina chef who helped lead the new Southern cuisine movement of the early 1980s. Turns out I had borrowed that active Southerner construction from Neal. A scholar esthete who spent as much time in the library as the kitchen, Neal rejected the conservative ethos of the moment. Chafing at conformity that the Reagan era demanded, he defined a newer South first through his revivalist cooking, later through writing that exalted the contributions of African Americans and Native Americans and others who had not previously gotten their due. All efforts were part of what he called his affirmation of an active Southern heritage. Neil used food to shape new and inclusive narratives of his people and his place. Thinking and writing today, more than a quarter century after his death, I struggle now toward a similar goal toward yet another reinvention of this beleaguered and beloved place. And so here we are in Nashville, at a moment when the city thrums with active Southerners. Nashville has one of the fastest growing immigrant populations of any American city. More than 10% of the population was born outside of the United States, and nearly half of those people are recent immigrants who entered the country since 2000. Damn it, recent Southerners. I'm making fun of myself. Today, more than 30% of students enrolled in metro schools speak a language other than English at home. This is an ideal moment to think about the idea of active Southerners, and Nashville is the ideal place to stage that conversation. So, thank you, Nashville, for reading my book and responding to my words, for embracing me as one of your own. And so now, that's a picture of myself and... and John at Taylor Grocery in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, it's a little later in the evening, um, <laughs> um, but it's a picture I treasure. So with those words, I want to bring some friends up to kind of jumpstart a conversation. And I'll call them by name. And as, as I call those names, if y'all would join me up here, I'll take this chair on the close end and y'all take these. And then we'll start a conversation that I hope y'all will join as well. Caroline Randall Williams earned her BA at Harvard or MFA in creative writing from the University of Mississippi, where I work. She's the author of the genre-bending novel um, Lucy Negro Redux and the YA novel Diary of B.B. Bright, Possible Princess. She is co-author with her mother, Alice Randall, who is somewhere in the audience, of Soul Food Love. Named one of the 50 people changing the South by Southern Living, she now serves as writer in residence at Fisk University here and also teaches at Montgomery Bell Academy. And next. <laughs> Monique Chohan, an author, television personality, philanthropist, and chef, among other concerns, has Chohan all ale and masala house. Monique is known for her work as a judge on... Food Network television show Iron Chef, Chopped, Iron, the next Iron Chef, every kind of chef. 
<laughs> but there's more about Manid. I'll go shorter. Um, she was born and raised in India's Punjab present. Province. She's a graduate of India's Welcome Group Graduate School of Hotel Administration and the Culinary Institute of America, and she has a book which I can recommend to you highly, Flavors of My World. Last, Sean Brock joins us. A native of Wise County, Virginia, Sean studied at Johnson & Wales University, cooked in Nashville and Richmond for joining McCready's in Charleston. In 2010, Brock and crew opened Husk in Charleston and followed that up with Husk in Nashville and now Husk in Greenville and Savannah. Brock won the Best Chef Southeast Award in 2010, featured on Mind of a Chef, and look for Chef's Table coming up soon in 18. Thank you, gentle people. All right, you have your mics. Ready, start. So, in prep, I asked one of our panelists to read a poem. And I don't think that was Monique, and I don't think it was Sean. Um, but it was Caroline. Okay, so. I, th I thought I, it was like an invocation I, I, as a way to you start. No, absolutely. Okay, so I narrowed it down to two. Um, and I'm reading the one I didn't think I was going to read. Um, is I think a lot about what it means to be a black woman in a southern kitchen um, and what it means to be a black body thinking about food in the present and, and what it means to have inherited that in the past. I'm light-skinned because some pretty black girl was darker-skinned in a kitchen 100 years ago in Georgia, and that looked good to some white man. Um, and so I think a lot about what my body means in this space and food and all of those intersections. And so I've got a poem um, that sort of examines that. Um, and it's called This Exit Sayeth That. Um, it takes some language from Elizabeth in England. It's a long story that's not for today. But um, this exit saith that I am wild and that I live by it and that I like it. I like the money and the witness, and the grotesque, and the yes, yes. This exit saith that I am not a partridge, or a booby. I am a potato, a beetroot. Not a precious bird or jewel, but a dirt-dug tube. Rustle me, rub me all over, and I will muddle your interiors with flecks of brown earth. You will sigh at your soiled hands, and then you will put them in your pockets to pay for it. This exit saith that you will come again to scour my body with your worthy emollient palm creases because I am that round, strange, colored victual. And further, this examinate saith that you will dirt grit your nails to gather me up, and by God we will both be sustained. By God, if you warm and eat me, I will nourish and fatten you. Thank you. I wrote that at Ole Miss. <laughs> I like that. I think about poetry as kind of the, the pot liquor of prose. We boil down beliefs, thoughts, ruminations, and we end up with something that is distilled down to the very essence of belief, and you did that beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with a question for Monique um, about opening a restaurant in Nashville um, and how compelled you fe felt in that moment to respond to kind of ideas about the South in opening a restaurant in Nashville. I remember I may maybe hot chicken pakora was on an early menu, right? But were there other ways beyond dishes that you felt a need to or want to respond to ideas about the South? You know, when you when um, you were mentioning about a new southerner, um, I I could so relate to that, right? And that's beyond me trying to say y'all, right? <laughs> and um, it, it was such a it's it's really interesting how life gets you to um, a particular spot. Um, I remember when I got the first phone call of 
how about opening a place in Nashville? To me, my idea of South was from pretty much Gone with the Wind. The, the romance of Gone with the Wind, you know? I'm like, oh, that's the South. And after, and my husband and I, we were in New York after quizzically looking at each other for a second as to who the beep goes to Nashville, we came over here and decided, we were like, we go to Nashville because we just fell in love with, um, with the soul of the city which is made by the people and the food. So the first time um, I had the hot, um, the hot chicken, uh, which is a religion over here, I was like, it was homecoming. And, and, um, and the meat and three, which is a concept which is, which is so, I mean, it's a universal concept, but over here it's been named. And that, those were the two things that I started the menu with. It was, and I called it Mayo to Nashville, the hot chicken pakora, and the meat and three. And I think to me, through, those, through these two, two dishes, um, it was me finding home in the South. And, and that's, I, I think it's just been a wonderful journey, y'all. <laughs> is, it, is it fair? I mean, when I think about the meeting three, I think about a tally tray and I see connections there too. Is that fair? Absolutely. And that's the first thing I thought. I was like meat with three sides, which were usually either collard greens, which were greens or, um, you know, black eyed peas or um, uh, maybe some, uh, you know, baked potatoes or mashed potatoes or, you know, sweet uh, potatoes. And I'm like, aha. This is, this is so home. This is how we eat. So it just was such a calling. Yeah, and I think about mango pickle and chow chow as two things that go on the side of your tally tray or your meat and three. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. um, a black eyed peas. I mean, uh, I, I grew up eating that. Mm -hmm. And over here, and, and literally, uh, it, it was such an exotic ingredient when I was in Chicago or in New York. And now it's like, it, it's like on each and every table. So it, it right. just makes it so much more interesting. And I, I see the same connectivity where I live in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, one of our favorite restaurants is a restaurant called Snack Bar, owned by Vishbat from Gujarat province of India. And come sweet, come um, boiled peanut season, come green peanut season, my favorite dish is a boiled peanut chot. Um, it's a dish that straddles both worlds beautifully. Truly beautiful. Absolutely. In my cooking class, I always do the boiled peanut chart because it's, it's so fun. It is, I think it definitely takes, um, you know, uh, I mean, cooking is pretty much taking the ingredients and the techniques which are in your environment and putting your own signature to it. And, and I think that's what it's all about, just using the ingredients over here and, and putting the twist that you've grown up with. So not letting go of your heritage, but just creating a completely new heritage based on the surroundings that you are in. And I think that's the most exciting part about being an immigrant in the South. Right. And, and Sean, that's a great kind of segue to a question for you, I think. You know, watching your career, I see someone who is both digging into various southern paths, whether that's low country or whether that's um, the Appalachian south from which you hail, and at the same time broaching new ideas, new techniques, and we have a tendency to want to, we want to frame those as two things in opposition, like digging into the past and thinking new. But I think you've managed your own kind of fusion of those two. Am I reading that right? And, and how do you think about those ideas of the the deep dig into the past and the embrace of the new at the same time? I think for me, I, I, th I think a lot about the future uh, of Southern food, and that's really what's at the front of my mind, um, this, this crazy curiosity. What's possible? Uh, exploring the possibilities. What does it mean to be a Southern chef uh, in 2025? What's that going to look like? What's that going to feel like? What's that going to taste like? But I, I believe that you can only get there if you can absorb the wisdom of generation, the generations before you. And I found that food carried those, those narratives, um, which is why I became such a, uh, a seed, uh, an avid seed saver, because for me, it, it's 
so, there's so much wisdom uh, that's carried with that seed um, that we can we can learn so much from, and you gain a completely different respect. Uh, you you get this different perspective, which allows you or allows me to wonder what's possible. Um, because if you look at the south, like if you draw, I always do this. If you draw a timeline and you just start plugging in the cultural influences throughout uh, the, the history of the South, once you get to present day, it's really exciting. It's insanely exciting um, to have a worldview um, in, in, of, of a cuisine and apply that to those Southern ingredients that carry those stories, that grabs you, you know? Like, in order for people to listen to the stories that has to be delicious, you know, and it has to be interesting, and it has to grab your attention. And uh, that's what I'm hoping for. And, and that, that idea of, you know, food, delicious food is almost a hook, right? You know, I'm gonna entice you with this, and then by way of that, we're gonna learn a lot about our past, and we're gonna ponder what our future might be. Yeah, a great example, the one that I always cite is a Hop and John that I ate when I came to Charleston in the late 90s. It didn't do anything for me. I'd read all these recipes and songs and poems, and uh, I, did, I was confused. I didn't, I didn't understand what the big deal was. Uh, and then, uh, around 2007, I had Hop and John with... Uh, West African red peas and, and, and Carolina gold rice. And I've been obsessed ever since that day. Um, and that dish has allowed uh, a lot of great conversations to occur uh, at the table. I think it's just such a, uh, a great connector. Um, and that conversa those conversations wouldn't have occurred if it was, this, it was Uncle Ben's rice and uh, canned uh, black eyed peas. And not all conversations focused on Southern food are easy to have. Um, some of them are very challenging, purposefully so. And Caroline, I wanted you to speak to that. Um, and you, you began to reference this in the poem you read. Um, but, you know, reading your book, Soul Food Love, um, that you and your mother, Alice Randall, did together, um, you make it very clear that not all writing about food in the South is gauzy and romantic. Um, Y'all use the, the term kitchen rape in your book to describe a reality of gender relations in the South. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Well, I think, you know, Mom and I had this opportunity to write this cookbook together that was an exploration of, you know, personal truths of our family legacy and then also bigger picture truths that would never have happened if I hadn't wound up moving to rural Mississippi straight out of college. I um, I'd became a core member with Teach for America, and I'd grown up here in Nashville, was raised eating Southern food. Um, my grandmother was a librarian um, for Tennessee State University, a black woman. My grandfather or husband was uh, a civil rights attorney here in Nashville, um, and so he made very little money. Um, and so she sort of supported the family with her income as a librarian and collected cookbooks and then would, you know, was the kitchen of the Nashville Civil Rights Movement in many ways. Um, and so I learned about food and about sustaining collective communities in the city and in the bigger picture through the lens of the idea of the civil rights movement, through the lens of the idea of these, of like a make, matriarchal structure and of like providing as an act of surviving, or creating food as an act of surviving. Um, and so then when the, and my grandmother, when she died, she left me 2,000 cookbooks, which is how Soul, what, <laughs> they, they, they live here in Nashville today. And that's how Soul Food Love came about um, in, in some ways. Um, but you know, you're thinking about this food and I was sitting there in 2011 in Greenwood, in Sunflower County, Mississippi, you know, and cooking the food that, you know, five generations of black women before me in the South had taught me to make. And my students were these black kids 
on a dirt road in the Delta telling me that I ate like a white girl um, because I baked my chicken because I didn't put fat back in my greens because I used spices instead of pork because um, I like to eat salted peanuts instead of pork rinds because I didn't want to go to Popeye's. Um, and I said, no, y'all, I eat like an old black lady. <laughs> I told them I ate like an old black lady. And I, and, but I called my mom, and I was looking around going, like, how do we reframe this narrative? Because we're dying from this. We're dying from this. Like, the, the idea that eating healthful, like eating greens, eating baked chicken, eating baked fish, eating a handful of berries, the idea that that is white is killing us. Um, and I'm living here in Mississippi on my teacher's salary, and I'm figuring it out, but it's a peculiar exercise, clearly, for a lot of people. Um, and so then this cookbook came about and it allowed me this opportunity to do this, like, sort of these radical acts of excavation about you know, I'd always known um, that there were European origins to much of my, or there were European roots to much of my, you know, genetic makeup, but um, thinking about how did that happen? Why were these women in those houses? Why, um, why were they exposed to those encounters? Um, and kitchens are why. Food is why. Um, you know, you ask... And this is one of the complicated things, you know, you sit at the SFA events and we talk about farm to table and how excited we are to curate corn or something, you know. And you tell black kids in the Delta that they should pick their vegetables and they're like, you want me to be a slave? You know, they ask you that. They say, what do you, wh why do you want me to touch, put my hands in dirt? Um, and I think that when we think about coveting this farm to table thing, farms... We're not so pretty here very recently. Um, and the vegetables were pretty, and the flavors were pretty, and the memories of those things are precious, but thinking about what it meant to put those greens on that table, put that corn, uh, pick those peaches, pick those apples, dig those yams out of the ground. How did those things get from the ground to the table? Whose hands were on them? Who got to eat them? Um, those are the questions that we spend a lot of time asking in the book that I spend a lot of time asking myself. I mean, I sit on both sides of that, you know, because of that <laughs> funny, complicated truth of the plantation rape. I am the rich white boy who ate the food and the um, strong black woman who endured the suffering. Um, that's, that's in my genes, so I'm trying to reconcile it now. But I think that I'll leave that there. I don't know what the answers are but I'm sitting with the questions. I think we're at a moment in Southern history where we're all asking ourselves bolder questions, tougher questions. Um, we're at a moment, I believe, of renaissance in the South. And you see that in music, you see that in literature, you see that in food, you see that in so many different ways, art, the ways we express ourselves. And in that moment of renaissance is the time to ask the tough questions. Um, when we are strongest, and we were ready for that, and we are, I think. Um, I wanted to ask one more question of Manit and then maybe one question of the group and then we open it up all to y'all because I bet y'all have better questions than I do. Um, I did want to ask Manit kind of about, um, I think you may have read this, this gentleman too. Um, I, I read a recent book called Uri, Curry, Eating, Reading, and Race um, and in which the author um, talks about stereotype and the way stereotypes applied to Indian cultures in the way that it can simplify a very complex place um, with many regions and many peoples. And he makes a beautiful comparison of that to the way he sees the way people depict the South, too. And I wonder, is, does that resonate with you, that notion of, you know, when, when you... I'm from India and people quickly reach some conclusion. Do you have to... Do you have to stand athwart that in any way? Is, there, is that part of who you are, what you have to do? I think um, uh, absolutely. Um, when, I was, um, when I was younger, um, I used to passionately hate the word curry powder, right? Because in traditional Indian cooking, there's nothing known as curry powder. 
right? Like I literally, somebody would come in, I would like, you know, walk into the kitchen muttering under my breath. <laughs> like I literally, I would get really passionately offended by it, right? But then you realize that human nature is such that it is going to stereotype anything, anywhere, I, I mean, anywhere. Like in India, um, in India, um, I am from Northern India, you know, Punjab Punjabis are stereotyped. I grew up in Eastern India, you know, people from Bengal. You know, there is, it is human nature. It's how you react to it and it's how you educate. Um, and, uh, and now I'm like, okay, you know what? How am I going to use the word curry to, to go ahead and depict what my cuisine is about? Right, and I am now using it in my favor as opposed to being offended about it. Absolutely, there is something. I mean, I can't tell you how eye-opening um, hearing your book has been. Right, like I, uh, to me, there are so many things which is, uh, which is so exciting. I mean, even like recently, I went to you know Hilton Head and I heard about Gichi cuisine, which I had never heard about. So, so to me, I myself stereotype people. I do it. Absolutely. But I think the smarter reaction is how to um, take these perceptions and explain to people that, oh, you know what? Curry actually means blah, blah, blah. These are the spice blends to it. So instead of being offended, to be more educational about it, and that's been my approach as I've gotten older. And th that's a, a somewhat traditional way that we've seen chefs define leadership. It's like, let me take a food and then let me unpack it for you and tell you about the complexity that lurks there and the complexity of the people who lurk there. Um, I'll, I'll close with one last question for you, Sean, and then we'll open it up. Um, there's a new kind of leadership role that chefs take now, Sean, that's not always based in the kitchen. Um, and you've been one of the leaders in that. Um, and I wondered if you'd speak to that and about the responsibilities you feel now as, you know, as a thinking human um, who's also a chef. <laughs> you know, for me, the last, so I'm, I've been a chef for 25 years. Um, I just turned 40, so I think I probably got 25 years in the kitchen left, um, hopefully. <laughs> and... I'm at that place in my life where I'm wondering what, what do I really need to start focusing on now? Because for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, a big focus of mine is repatriation of, of um, the old crops and, and animal breeds. And um, we're getting there. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see all these plants and uh, animal breeds popping up on menus everywhere. I remember when we opened Husk in 2010, it was terrifying because we only, you know, we, we made a rule that we were only going to buy stuff produced in the South, and we quickly realized how limited that was, and to see how far it's become in eight years is mind-blowing. And so I think for me, what I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of my energy on is um, working with people like Brian Ward at the Vegetable Institute, which is an extension of Clemson, to take these varietals, make sure they're as nutritious as possible, and figure out how to get them to um, the masses. How to, how to convince um, farmers that uh, it's, it's worth growing organically. And uh, I think, that's really, really important. We have it now. We, this is what we should be eating and serving, but we can't right now because the cost, or we, we aren't currently because the cost of growing these things organically is, is so much. You have to charge so much for it or else it doesn't exist. Um, so my goal is to get it to a point where um, the seeds are just everywhere and, uh, and that food becomes commonplace again. And then also I think about what would have, what would I have benefited from as a teenager? Um, and <laughs> I went to um, Johnson and Wales and, and uh, just recently paid it off. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, 20 years later, 
And it's the education piece. Um, it's the idea of a restaurant and its responsibility to a community to provide uh, an educational place for uh, you know, underprivileged people to learn a craft and a skill. That's what I love about the restaurant industry. It, it's just such a hands-on um, skill that's passed on um, and that you don't necessarily have to go to school for. Uh, and be in debt for the rest of your life or not have the opportunity to even go to school so you don't even try to be a professional chef because you see everybody on TV and you think, well, I have to go to school to be a chef. Um, so for me, it's getting the food um, as nutritious and delicious as possible to as many people as possible and to uh, really pay attention to the communal responsibilities of a restaurant beyond providing jobs. I think that educational opportunity is uh, something that if 10% of the restaurants in each city participated in, uh, we would just see an incredible, we'd see incredible results. Thanks, Sean. Um, let's open this up to questions from y'all. Um, if, um, if you will shout them out, I will repeat the questions so that others might hear. Um, are there questions? Yes, sir. Um, I'm just blown away by all three of uh, y'all's stories. Um, many, my wife, uh, her husband is from, or my wife's father is from Bombay. So we go to Indian um, at least twice a week. Uh, Sean, I um, work in uh, the Napier community. I would do this. <laughs> um, I live and work in the Napier community of Nashville, which is about, I think, across the footbridge, maybe 0.5 miles from uh, Husk. Um, and I work with uh, students at Napier Elementary School and uh, Harvest Hands Community Development to grow uh, food and community gardens in Napier. Um, and Caroline, uh, through that, to try to access the food story um, and ask the community to reshape their food story. Um, but what I've found um, is very difficult is, is some of the things that you mentioned. Um, to, to, to reshape a food story requires even the, the perspective that it needs to be reshaped or that there is a story to tell. Um, and so little anecdotes like um, a lot of the, the, the grains that um, the, the West African grains that we raise in America today came over in slave ships in the hair of African women who saved seeds because they cared so much about their craft. Um, and, and another anecdote being that um, you know, men in African villages would attract their wives by the, the size of their compost pile. Like these are true stories that are connected to the stories of the students that I work with. Um, but finding ways, and this isn't, maybe this is the same question you said you're asking and don't know the answer to, but finding ways um, to begin that conversation and to retell a story so that it, the food story that the students in our city, the underprivileged students in our city have isn't one that leads to, to death and diabetes, but one that actually um, promotes health. So if that sparks anything from either of three of you, I'd love to hear it. My question is, um, where, where do we start? Um, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a question, and being a black or and a white man, the question doesn't start with me. Uh, the question starts uh, with, with the community that I work in. Um, but would love to hear what you guys think and how do we begin to address that? So, much of what, and obviously what you've said is so resonant to me. Um, I would ask them to figure out what their family's oldest food story is because they'll surprise themselves because they'll ask their mom who will ask her mother. And one of the complicated things about, you know, especially in um, poverty-stricken and in black America is that the generations are quite quick to turn over. You know, mom, daughter is 16, mom is 40. And like, so, the, so it takes, you have to go back a lot of generations to get back enough years. I have the luxury of all the women waiting a long time to have kids. So my great-grandmother was born in 1912, um, and I was born in 1987. But that's not true. But so I was able, it wasn't many generations back for me to get to 1912. But if you ask a kid what their family's food history is, 
you know, one of the most resonant moments for me was um, this woman, Ruthie Collins, who she'll just never know how much she changed my life. She's still a good friend of mine, and I try to tell her, but she'll never know fully. Um, Sunflower County native through and through, born and raised there, still there. Um, really struggled with her weight, with kidney problems, diabetes, prediabetes, all of these things. And she said to me that, you know, I told her about my cookbook, and she said, you know, that sounds familiar. I said, tell me more. You know, and she said, my mother-in-law came over the other day and told me, Ruthie, you've got a pie on this counter every week. And Ruthie said, yes, I do. It's for my kids. And, and she said, Ruthie, we, that's celebration food. That's not everyday food. That's what her mother-in-law, who's also from Sunflower County, told her. Um, and she said, you don't need that. It's not special if you make it every day. It's not special if there's a piece of pie for every kid every day. And we've conflated celebration food and everyday food because of convenience food, because of fast food, because of these grocery stores, because of the readiness, readily availableness of sugar and flour and all these things. Um, and I think that that was like a sort of uh, uh, breaking open in a good way point for me when she, when she told me what her mother-in-law had said to her about that um, and really thinking about trying to divide those things and trying to figure out where we get back to a memory of something wholesome, where we get back to those bene seeds and the braids. You know, why, is, why are sesame seeds? Why, are, why is that southern food? Why did we forget that? Because it, it has been forever, you know? Um, just asking, asking them to do some of their own history taking, I think, because then it gives them some agency. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Okay. Um, okay wait a you should go to my number one. I'd like to follow up with your saying about you know, you hear the food history and things like that. Um, I grew up in Nashville. I had a very interesting childhood because I grew up in Vanderbilt among lots of kids from different countries. So the lady across the street from us was from Iran. My best friend was from India. The lady who babysat us was Nigerian, named Luna. So we were always open to that. So I was at New Nashville, and then decided to go to USC, go to all the fun things, and then came back and became a chef. Um, my brother convinced me to come back to Nashville and work at the Hermitage Hotel. He's like, you need to come back to Nashville because Nashville is a food city now. My question to you guys is, right now I see this growth in Nashville and this Southern Renaissance, and I'm, I'm torn. I feel a moral dilemma because I cannot get over the fact when you talk about this is celebration food, those kids don't know that because they're not taught that. We go back to talking about the chicken and the fried chicken and hot chicken. Hot chicken wasn't big when I grew up here. And I grew up here. I used to go to Mary's on Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. You weren't even allowed to cross Charlotte. So I hear these stories and everybody's so excited and I feel like that part gets lost. But then, as a train chef, I went to Neki, and I went and I traveled all in the Caribbean, and I saw that other side because I was ashamed of being a Southern woman, and I wanted to make sure you knew I could do more than fried chicken and make biscuits. So I went to go learn all those other things because I was told they weren't worth anything. Mm -hmm. And now I see all this stuff coming in with stuff you're bringing in, Sean, and it's great, and I'm seeing this renaissance. But how do you have all these outsiders now coming in and watering it down and not knowing the story and not being resentful and still making sure the stories get told over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem I have right now because I go into places and they put Southern food in front of me and I want to throw the table. <laughs> so I think you just answered your own question right now, right? You just answered your own question. I think being a chef, one of the most quintessential uh, traits to being a chef is to have passion, which you have lots of, right? And each and every person absolutely has a cause that, that they are drawn to. If you're drawn to a cause, you can easily talk about it, 
right? I mean, um, I mean, like like Sean was talking about, right? There is this cause, and he he has been. I mean, how many years has he been just trying to figure out ways to make people see that? And you have that power. We as chefs have the best best language out there, which is food, right? I mean, literally tables, I mean, dining tables have been the, the biggest um, sources of change. So to me, I think it is, everybody has a unique story. There is history, absolutely. I think people need to learn more about the place they are in to delve into the history. But then as chefs, we are also artists where we have the, um, the creative freedom to come up with things with our own signature. And I think that is something absolutely, if you feel so strongly about it, you should go after that and you should uh, talk about it and get to the history. And then, you know, kids, uh, the kids that you were talking about, find people who have the same voice and more people who know about it, the more this, this renaissance will come about, but not a renaissance of people's own interpretation, but the actual, the actual resurgence of these delicious uh, dishes that you associate Southern uh, food with. I was gonna say Instagram. <laughs> ah, help. I'm kidding. I, I was going to take say take everybody to Silver Sands once Ooh, a week. Totally. <laughs> oh, I was just the my my answer to that question is every day I just try to make the best decision I know how to make, and um, if there are people around me that that are inspired by that, that's amazing. And I'm very, very, very lucky to have uh, the platform that I have. And uh, man, it's so easy to have resentment, it's so easy to get upset. But you, you can only do what you, what do, you can only do your best, the, your best, that's all you can ask of yourself. Um, and that's just, I think if we all had some uh, empathy and c compassion, we'd realize that that's all, that's, if we all just put our head down and said, all right, we're, we're gonna make the best, the, the next best decision we could possibly make with all these things in mind, I think uh, we'd start to get somewhere. So don't throw the table. <laughs> um, no, 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 we're, we're, she's a black woman in the South. <laughs> And I'm not a respectability politics person, but I am a work three times as hard and have what you want if you want it person, um, because the world is not fair. And we're living in, like, you know, I think a lot about this in terms of, like, me too. Like, you wanna talk about sexual harassment in the workplace? <laughs> like, talk to me about all in the kitchen, in the field, in the house, like, in the nursery, like, everywhere, like, we're tired, but, you know, we'll take it, like, okay, Ashley Judd, like, I see you, okay, like, y'all just raise your hand, and we'll just support you now, but, like, because, like, any way to move forward with the cause, right, um, so the same thing with Southern food, because black women were the ones fixing it, like, let's not make any mistake. Um, and black people were people growing it, picking it, farming it, like in, in, in large part of the kind of food we're talking about. So of course you're exhausted, of course it's frustrating, of course you wanna throw the table, but you know what, everyone is here, they're looking at Nashville, we are living in the day of Beyonce. Black girl magic is a thing. So just try and like, you know, have a bourbon, <laughs> have a bourbon, Roll your eyes, cook your food, because it's your moment now. And it's exhausting that it took the, all of this for it to happen, but it's still your moment now. Um, and so walk into it. Your brother was right to tell you to come home. He was right, you're, you're back, you belong here, you've got a place here, you've got more um, roots than anybody who's moving here. And if you're doing the right thing, then you have more than anybody else has who's in the game. I think we have time for yes in the back. 
Um, Mr. Edge, reading your book made me want to write my own food story because I am the granddaughter of an Appalachian man who picked tobacco and cotton. And on the other side, my grandfather was raised by a black mammy. And the recipes that he has passed down are from black women, black cooks. And my question, follow up to what this woman over here said, is where does my voice belong? Because I don't want to inappropriately appropriate black southern recipes, but they are also part of my story. Uh, so how do we embrace, as a white woman, how do I embrace southern soul food without uh, inappropriately doing that? Thanks for the question, and I, I won't own this. I, I will share this question with my colleagues. Um, but I've thought a lot about this, and it's one of the most frequently asked questions I got when my book um, came out in hardback, um, that idea of cultural appropriation and well-meaning people wanting to figure out how to act. You know, And this is a moment when we're all trying to figure out how to act in various situations. Um, I'll say one thing that, that kind of gives me perspective is, you know, a generation before the problem was that white Southerners did not claim the black South. White Southerners did not claim black food. White Southerners, when they referred to skilled black chefs, they used their first name and not their last name. Um, so for the longest time, the problem was white failure to appropriate, to claim the black South as their own, to claim black expertise and black knowledge and black genius as a Southern thing, right? So the South was defined by white Southerners as white, and that was our problem before. And now here comes a new day when white Southerners are trying to figure out, okay, how do I define my South today? How do I pay credit to African Americans without appropriating, without claiming it as my own? And I think you know, that answer is complicated and I can't even pretend to, to offer you an answer, but I can say this, it's to give credit where credit is due. Um, it is not to flinch, it is to recognize that the South is biracial, triracial, now multiracial, um, and to pay homage to the cooks who came before us. Um, I borrowed this term and I used in the book from John Edgerton to pay down debts of pleasure that we owe to previous generations. So as a white Southerner, I encourage you to do that not motivated by guilt, but my love and, and an embrace of the South that we all know. Yeah, I agree. I think it's about intentions. Like, if, if you really focus on what your intentions are, culinary appropriation, that people are so scared to have those conversations. I think it's amazing that they're being, um, these, these difficult conversations are happening because the narrative needs to continue and we all need to learn and we all need to, to look at different perspectives and that changes your intentions. Um, and everybody kind of hopefully works together and understands uh, each other. And I think I, I, I don't mind the culinary appropriation um, discussions that everybody feels you know, weird about. Um, I say have the conversations often. I, and I pledge that next time we answer this question, two white men won't speak first. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's, it's, it's in keeping with tradition. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, what would I say? I'm related to lots of nice white Southern men. Um, one, you know, so Sean, you cooked like two years ago, three years ago, the, the lunch, the big lunch at SFA. And I was exposed to a lot of really interesting white people Southern food too. 
you made like leather britches or what's that called? Some really interesting, I mean, that, I mean, there was like an eight, nine course, 12 course. It was like many, many courses that meal. We start, we made 23 different things. 23? Yeah. Jesus. Okay. That's the bourbon. I'm sorry. I mean, there was a lot of courses that meal. Um, so one, you said that on one side you had a, a family from the, you know, that has you know, Appalachian food is its own, you know, rich white southern food that you could explore and that would be one way to enter into the conversation that would be like completely benign and uncomplicated and the other way would be to go find your uh grandfather's mammy's family and collaborate and step back because it could be that they don't have access to the i mean i mean whatever their circumstances i won't presume Whatever their circumstances, you could find them and collaborate and take a back seat. If you really care about the story, um, then allow them, provide them with a platform to help navigate the story and, and be behind um, and heal some of that dynamic within your family's narrative. That would be another way to do that. You know, I, um, I personally find appropriation very exciting, right? Just because, um, to me, I mean, for example, Chai Pani, right? Merwan. Merwan's, um, uh, our, our chef Asheville friend. Asheville and Decatur, Georgia, Chai Pani. It's great. Chai Pani. It's, it's amazing, right? They have the most amazing um, street foods of India. And you walk into the kitchen, and other than Merwan, you do not see another brown person. You don't. I mean, it is Indian f food which is being cooked by an entire kitchen of white people. And the food is amazing. So to me, it is very exciting that your cuisine, a cuisine that I have grown up with, is being given the respect that for generations we were taught to give French food. You to go to culinary school, French food is the epitome of food, right? And now the cuisine that was considered very... Um, ethnic or pedestrian is getting the same kind of respect from people all over, um, you know, the world. To me, that's exciting. To me, I mean, I don't think appropriation is a dirty word. I think it's a beautiful word. We have... There we go. Come on. She's coming with a mic for Look, you I'm so running. we can hear you. Speaking of French food, I lived in uh, Paris for five years right after college, and the French spend a much higher percentage of their income on food and a much greater amount of time on food. We obviously are the enlightened, right? But do you think <laughs> there will ever come a time when the majority of Americans recognize that Wonder Bread is gross? <laughs> no. Okay, that's, that's what I thought too, but I just thought, it's so exciting. I mean, I'm old enough to remember TV dinners, you know, the aluminum trays that you put in the oven, and um, yeah, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go, huh? I'm going to have a very controversial answer to that. Okay. Right? French food, um, French food had some amazing marketing behind it. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, if you look at foods all over the world, from China to Japan to, I mean, southern food to Indian food, it, the techniques are the same. But the French, they, um, Escoffier decided to, he's like, oh, this is saute and this is braise, right? To me, I think it's marketing. It boils down to marketing. Each and every cuisine around the world has the same amount of complexity. It's the, I mean, um, the food in the South, I mean, the slow braises, the slow cooked food, that's the most delicious. Again, you take a lot of time, the food is delicious. It's all over the world. I'm sure that there is a wonder baguette somewhere in France. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, think, I think slowly people are realizing um, the beauty of, you know, um, whole grain, beautiful artesian, uh, uh, you know, sardos, etc. So, yeah, I think Wonder Bread is going to be a thing of the past. Okay. 
We had one hand way in the back, and I can't even see who it is, but your hand's so, you're so far back and your hand's so high, you should ask a question. I, I question whether um, Southern foods are as segregated as, uh, as you suggest, and I've had the opposite experience. I'm originally from Northwest Alabama, part of the dislocated Appalachians toward the western part of the state. My father worked for the DuPont Company, and after World War II, at five years of age, my father was transferred to Deepwater, New Jersey. And I can remember my grandmother feeling very frustrated and feeling like we were going to hell's back door because there wasn't even a Southern Baptist church uh, in that area. But more important to my family, there weren't Southern vegetables. And I can remember my mother and father kind of racing over who could grow what, depending on when they got it. And my grandmother in rural Alabama shipped okra seeds, shipped black eyed pea seeds, shipped butter beans, all this different stuff. And we had a garden space, but we didn't have enough people to work it, and we didn't have a mule. And uh, my mother basically cut lots with other people that would be willing to work there in order to get that. And some of them just contended they could not live without certain vegetables. But my mom successfully did that. And no one coming up to her that I know of was ever turned away. And they didn't ask them if they were black or they're white. Um, and I think also there's a suggestion of, of class unanimity among whites that really wasn't there for a lot of the South. You know, when you look at that, people that weren't planters, weren't, weren't part of that class, they were able to buy into part of it after the Civil War with segregation. But uh, I think there was much more of a polyglot mixing. Vivian Howard, who does uh, the program you worked on, Sean, um, Chef's Mind, I love her program. Maybe it has something to do with I have a PhD from University of North Carolina, and she brags about it sometimes. But, but I love the way she goes back and does really kind of a historical discovering. I'll take rice the way that she worked with rice and talked about people who were trying to retrobreed that rice or who had located you know, seed stock. Uh, that shows you the, the variety of things that uh, went into making up uh, Southern food. I appreciate your work. There was no question attached to that. Okay. All right. So anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. She's coming with the mic. Who am I giving the mic to? Um, so all of you have decided to be tastemakers um, in a very specific space. That's the South. Um, to me, Southern food is low and slow. If you didn't start in the morning or the night before, it doesn't count. <laughs> um, how do you, when you're thinking of what you're going to craft next, how do you navigate the gray space of this is Southern enough or this is like I've gone a little too, I've strayed a little too far away. Like how do you decide, do you, do you decide, do you say I'm, living in Nashville, I'm below the Mason-Dixon, whatever I make in my kitchen, that counts. Or when you're preparing your menus, are there specific ways that you decide to balance, you know, how you keep it? This is Southern, this is traditional, this is like Southern with a twist or a flavor, or however. I'll start as, the, as a non-chef up here and, and say that, you know, your question really, in some ways, is about authenticity and, and authenticity at the stove. And, um, you know, I think about things in terms of honesty instead of authenticity um, because I see my time at the stove as a, as a you know, week-a-day cook. I'm not thinking about whether something represents the South, um, but I do think about what grows in the South because that's what I want to cook and I want to pay homage to the place from which I'm from when I step to the stove. I do think about that. But it means that, for me, honest food does that, but isn't bound by authenticity, isn't bound by tradition. It is bound by the South now, the South today. And that means that last week I cooked a big old pot of collard greens. Um, and after I 
stemmed them, um, after I chopped them, after I washed them. I didn't toss in a hunk of pork. Um, I used fish sauce, Vietnamese fish sauce. You get the same funk, um, that same umami punch. And I didn't do it for reasons of health and a fear of pork. I did it because fish sauce was on the counter right by our stove and we use it often. And I love fish sauce. I love that taste. So, you know, I think, you know, I encourage you to think about various ways that we define ourselves in the South today. And it's not always, I think, about, for me as a cook, about some reference to authenticity and some reference to what the South is, but it's about honest ways of cooking that use Southern ingredients, use what grows in our backyard, whatever place that may have originated from, and use ingredients to come floating into the corner store like fish sauce. I love that question. Um, I mean, your question to me just sounds like, what is Southern food to you? What is Southern cuisine? I define it as um, a combination of the, the foods that thrive in a particular region combined with the cultural influences, past and present. I think that's fascinating. And I put fish sauce in everything. Audie gets really mad. <laughs> Uh, so, to me, it's, it goes back to intention and, and honesty, you know. It, but there is, I, I, I feel a certain responsibility of keeping the the plants alive, the the, the, the seeds saved because of the wisdom that they carry uh, and, the, and the narratives that they can uh, conjure up. You know, um, food is, to me, um, I've had a lot of heated arguments about authenticity, right? Uh, especially when it comes to, um, and again, I go back to Indian food because that's what I've grown up with, right? And people are like, this is not authentic Indian food. And then I'm like, so what is authentic Indian food? It probably is raw meat, right? Because there were no chilies in India till probably the, the 14th, 15th century. I mean, chilies came to India. There were no tomatoes. But now chicken tikka masala, which was, not even, which was not even made in India. It's a British invention. It's considered traditional, authentic Indian food. So to me, I think food is all about evolution. Even when we talk about Southern food, Southern food has evolved to what we think Southern food is. And it is going to continue uh, evolving. So to me, I think what is authentic is, you know, uh, as John said, that um, give credit where credit is due. So, um, I mean, I, um, I I don't want to take a traditional southern recipe and say that this is tra a traditional southern recipe. No. If I'm going to be taking, uh, you know, a recipe from Sean's book and, and uh, you know, giving credit, that is authentic to him. But if I go ahead and put some curry powder in it, then it's authentic to me, right? So I think in the end of the day, to me, authentic is what is authentic to me, what is authentic to the environment, what I am getting from the South. And um, it is celebrating, uh, it's celebrating the region as opposed to just ideas of dishes which have been in, uh, evolving and will continue evolving. I love that. And I was just telling Monique backstage, you know, my favorite thing at her restaurant is a wonderful intersection of Canadian and British Indian food, the chicken tikka masala poutine. It's like really delightful. It's, like, it's exactly, it's my favorite consolation meal on a Saturday evening. Um. <laughs> so I have effectively pissed off Indians and Canadians no, in one dish. And, and, and made one black Southern woman very happy. <laughs> but, but, um, and I, I just want to add to that, because you guys, everything you've said is so resonant to me. Um, I think also the spirit in which it was made can be Southern. Do you know, I mean, when I, when, when I order Thai food, if I'm having friends over on a Sunday afternoon and I say... Y'all were not drinking out of 
cans. We're not eating out of tubs. And we're, I'm going to iron these napkins because my great grandmother is watching. That's Southern, right? That is a Southern meal. We're drinking out of my mason jars. We're eating with my f- forks and knives that I like. You know, I polish my silver once a month. I put on my I put out my iron napkins because I'm a Southern girl. I was raised to prepare food in the spirit of like love and comfort that I have understood for generations. And I think the spirit in which a thing is prepared has to do with where it belongs as well. Um, and so that to me makes a Southern meal too. Um, and I'm sure, and people, again, these are things that people do in many places. I'm not saying that, although my napkins are, I did steal them from the SFA dinner at the Parthenon. <laughs> <laughs> and they are denim and handmade in Nashville. So they are actually extra Southern. However, <laughs> so I'll just leave that at that. All right, so um, before we all get up and eat and drink and are merry, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Ken Oliver, who's the director of the library, for hosting us here tonight. Beautiful. To Carolyn Randalls Williams, Manit Chohan, Sean Brock. And our Nashville Reads author, John T. Edge, thank you all so much. And we will see you all out here. Okay, thank you so much.